Good morning. My name is Vernon Smith, and I'm Research Services Workplace Culture and Training Manager. You just heard from Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. I also welcome you to the 2019 Virtual Genealogy Fair. Before we begin our six sessions, I have three helpful tips on how to participate with chat and access the captioning and the handouts. First, because we are broadcasting live, you can chat with the other family historians and ask presenters questions. First log into YouTube and then type your comments and questions there. Speakers will answer chat questions at the end of their talks during the question and answer time. Secondly, for live captioning, find the provided link on this page below the video screen. Open the link in a separate browser window. And if you don't currently see the link, simply click where it says show more. Thirdly, for handouts, look for the links provided on this page. After the event, the video presentations and handouts will remain available. And I am now turning over the lectern to Andrea Matney, the coordinator of the Virtual Genealogy Fair. Andrea. Thank you, Vernon. Welcome and hello. My name is Andrea Matney. Please know that Vernon Smith my, and my coworker, Amber Forrester, and I are responding to the YouTube chat and will be the voices of your questions at the end of each session. So welcome to session of, first session of the 2019 Virtual Genealogy Fair, Exploring History Hub for Genealogists and Researchers by presenters Rebecca Collier, Darren Cole, and Kelly Osborne. They'll be introducing History Hub, the National Archives crowdsourced platform for history and genealogy research, including some background guidance for getting started and how to join the community. Ms. Collier is the Research Services History Hub coordinator at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. Mr. Cole is a digital engagement specialist at the National Archives in Washington, DC. Ms. Osborne is a community manager and web developer at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. I am now turning the broadcast over to Kelly Osborne. Thanks, Andrea. So um, History Hub is um, our crowdsourcing platform um, for researchers. Uh, here's kind of what the the uh, what it looks like. It's um, not just for genealogists, it's for people who are also researching um, any kind of historical like documents or if they have questions about um, about uh, military records. Here's uh, what it looks like when you go to history.gov. Um, it's very simple and Darren's going to show you later like kind of how it works. On the home page, you can see a list of blog posts that are really uh, helpful. Um, they're kind of our first stop for answering questions. Um, a lot of people are interested in finding out about it, a Native American ancestor. Um, it's very complicated, so we have a blog post that kind of outlines um, first steps. Um, you can see a list of recent questions, and then you can see um, a list of communities that we have. For example, we have our researchers help. It's kind of our catch-all for like if you don't know what your um, who can best answer your question, just throw it in the researchers help, and we're, we'll redirect it. So History Hub is a platform where people can get answers from multiple sources. You can ask a question, and we've got um, people on the um, on the site who are like professors of history, um, amateur genealogists like a whole community of citizen experts, people who are writing books, people who are professional researchers. It's also a knowledge base that scales and improves with time. So you can ask a question and then see um, how other people answered it. Um, people can come back months later or even years later and add additional information. It's also the result of ongoing research that we did into how organizations communicate with and serve their audiences. We looked at um, a lot of federal agencies and also um, outside the federal sphere. 
So History Hub, the idea of it is based on trends in consumer research and it's powered by the same platform as the Apple support community. So like if you have a question and you're not sure who has the answer, most likely you will um, Google it. And um, if it's, you know, if it's about a technology uh, problem, it will take you to a, a community very similar to History Hub. So to kind of give you an example that is a relatable real world example that's outside of, uh, outside of History Hub. Um, I had a laptop that started making a disturbing noise. It's a very old MacBook. Um, I love it, it's a workhorse, but it's very old. So I started making this um, hideous beeping noise right before I had um, a big presentation where I had to like take it off. So I Googled, why is my laptop, laptop making this weird beeping noise? This is comparable to the research question that we would get in History Hub, like how do I find whatever? So I Google it and I find um, this is a common problem. Um, my MacBook Pro is making a beeping noise. It was just like that. So I click the link. Um, this is kind of comparable to the uh, Lucky Trayson is comparable to the researcher on History Hub. And you can see that this is a common problem. So the person asked the question, um, why is it doing this? Um, within minutes, they got a response from a citizen expert. This was exactly the answer to my problem. And then someone provided additional information that was helpful, but it didn't show up in my original search. So this was hugely successful for me. I asked a specific research question. I got an answer within minutes, seconds really. And the people who, who helped me were not the not Apple staff, um, which is important for the National Archives because if you are if you ask a question of the archives and you have um, you, ha it's going to take a while for an archivist to be assigned to it and work through their um, work through their workload to to respond. So additionally, the answer is available to anyone who Google's a similar research question. Which, um, so this kind of paradigm has set user expectations, not just for, um, for tech problems, but for like knowledge in general, for, uh, for problems in general. People wanna be able to ask a specific question instead of like reading, um, you can, I could read the uh, Mac manual, um, which I'm never gonna do ever. Um, I wanna be able to know exactly what the problem is um, asking a specific question. And I want to get help pretty immediately. Um, I don't care who the answer comes from. And I want to be able to ask follow-up questions and have um, follow-up information appended easily. And I want to be able to search and find the answer easily because um, I'm not going to, like, I don't want to have to search for it. I kind of, I want to, I don't want to have to spend a whole lot of time finding my answer. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca Collier, who's gonna kind of talk about the problems that History Hub can solve for, uh, for genealogists. Thank you, Kelly. So what problems can History Hub solve? Um, at the National Archives, we respond to over 25,000 25, non-personnel related questions a year on a one-to-one -one basis, either by email, snail mail, or telephone, plus in-person consultations to one of our research rooms. Um, many of the questions are similar, and our responses for the record, same records, over and over again. They may seem different to you, but they are the same for us. Um, here's an example on History Hub of a request that was made um, about um, a NATO operation. And um, since uh, the U.S. Navy was involved, we offered uh, deck logs for part of the information. Deck logs are one of our very popular records. But they don't contain all the information. Oops, sorry. Um, so much for me doing this right. Uh, they don't always provide a complete 
answer to questions because the answers may be somewhere else. As you can see, we've referred the researcher to, Na to the Navy Historical uh, Command, the NATO archives, for records in their custody that may um, contain the rest of the information that they need to complete their research. Here's another example of, of a request that probably won't be in the custody of NARA, but we let the researcher know that there's various universities and the university and the uh, Library of Congress has information on their topic. So we don't leave you in limbo. Here's an example of the Library of Congress manuscript division responding to a request. And here's an example of a researcher sharing what they know with another researcher, and uh, the researcher who got the information was very appreciative. So what are our goals with History Hub? It's an additional tool that we can use to assist researchers and genealogists in a different way for them to connect with us. Responses to requests are not limited just in our staff, but also the general public who have conducted uh, research can also answer um, to things that they've already looked at and are willing to share what they know. Over time, a knowledge base will be compiled, and not only will this help with customer service, but also meet the needs of knowing an answer in less time than they're currently receiving. And we hope eventually this will help decrease our reference load. And what are the most popular communities? Uh, the military records is by far the most popular, and it has everything from uh, the Revolutionary War to the present. Genealogy, which covers everything from immigration, naturalization, census, are, and other records that are at the National Archives, plus birth, death, and marriage records that are not. Uh, researcher help, which is uh, basically a catch-all as Kelly mentioned, but it's geared to our civilian agencies such as State Department, FBI, Justice, except, and, except for those concerning Native Americans or African Americans. We have special communities set up for those questions and those topics because they have a unique uh, community that is interested in them. And the Library of Congress has a community called Crowd on our site, and they have this for their transcription project. NARA also has a transcription project under the community called Citizen Archivist. And Darren will tell you how to use History Hub. Thanks, Becky. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to sort of how to search and navigate around History Hub. Uh, as Kelly showed us earlier, this is what the home page looks like, and really the main feature of the home page is that search bar right there. Um, that's where you can go ahead and type in your question when you first come to the site. Um, and as this demonstrates, you just start typing in your question into the search bar, and then the system will automatically start suggesting potential questions and answers that may be related to your question. Uh, so hopefully one of those suggested questions there that pop up will actually help answer your question right away so you won't have to um, search any further. So if you click one of those links on one of those suggested questions, I'm going to wait for it to pop up here, it takes you down to the question page, and the first thing it asks you is, does this help to answer your question, yes or no, uh, and take me back. Um, or you can search the entire community uh, in more depth. Um, so let's say maybe you're not happy with that search result. You can actually use the main search um, button in the top right-hand corner of the page, and that will help search the entire site, so not just questions but also blog posts and other content on the site. Um, and then that will take you to the main search results page, um, and that will uh, give you options to filter your search results. You can filter it by uh, the, uh, the date, how recent it is, how relevant. You can restrict results by author or by community and help to filter your results that way. Now let's suppose uh, that question was not, was not answered by some of those suggested options. Uh, so then you go ahead and type your question. You say, my question does not have an answer yet in this instance, and then you just click the Ask button. 
Now we're going to assume that you're probably not logged in, and in order to post a question or post any content on History Hub, everyone needs to have an account. Uh, and that kind of helps cut down on spam and anonymous posts and uh, issues like that. So you'll see this prompt to either log in or create an account. And so now we'll cover our really briefly how to create an account on History Hub. So you see this page where you can either log in or uh, if you don't have an account, and we'll assume that's the, that's the case here, you just go ahead and enter your email address. And what will happen is the system will then send you a confirmation registration link to your email. So all you want to do is open your email and click that confirmation link, and that will take you back to the site. And it will pro provide you with the Create Your Account page. And it has some basic fields there that you're probably familiar with, first name, last name, username, email. Uh, and you also have to create a password. And uh, one of the issues users sometimes have is creating a password that meets our requirements. And because we're a federal site, we have heightened security requirements, and users do sometimes have an issue with that. So there are some basic minimum uh, requirements you need to meet. Uh, you have to have a lowercase letter, uppercase letter, number, special character, a minimum of 12 characters. And then you have to enter the CAPTCHA code down there. And again, that prevents um, bots and other um, automatic uh, registrations from um, spam bots and things like that. Uh, but it's a, it's a fairly simple process. And now that you're logged in, you'll see the home page again. And you'll see some custom user links in the upper right-hand corner. You'll see a link that will take you to your notifications and inbox. And you'll see a link that will take you to your uh, profile and preferences page. And if you click the notifications link, this is sort of what your inbox will look like. You'll see if you're following various discussions, you'll see announcements about those. And you also get various prompts uh, from the system, such as how to update your profile and user avatar and other options like that. And if you click the, uh, the profile link, you'll get options such as how to adjust your uh, user preferences and um, other options. Now let's say you follow the link to customize your user profile. You have the option to upload a uh, profile photo, and that's entirely optional. You also have the option to choose a user avatar that helps sort of customize your content. And again, that's also entirely optional. You have the option of selecting from one of these sort of pre-chosen images from NARA records, or you can upload your own. And again, one caveat is that all user content, whether it's a post or a photo, or use an avatar, all of that is all uh, moderated for appropriateness to meet our um, user standards. Here's how you set your user preferences. Uh, for example, the system will email you with various notifications, and you can set how often or if you get emailed at all by the system for various updates, such as if your question gets answered or if there's activity on another question that you've been following. Now we want to get to the crux of the issue, which is asking that question that you had originally. So we're back on the home page. Uh, we start typing in our question into the search box. And again, presuming there's not another question that already answers it, we'll go ahead and click that Ask button. And then that will take us to the question page. Uh, and this is how you write a, a good question post. There are some uh, kind of tips and guidelines that we offer to help people write an accurate question that helps you get a, a more expedient and more accurate response. Uh, number one, you want to use a succinct and descriptive title. Don't type your entire question into the title box. Try to summarize it as best you can. Here are some key details you want to include, and these really help us to narrow down the type of records we're looking at. Um, number one, who are you researching? Uh, what do you already know about them? These are really important details to share. Where did they live? When do you think they lived? Who might have been their relations and ancestors? And also super important is where have you already searched? What other archives and uh, libraries and sources have you already checked? So that we don't repeat that and make you, um, you know, backtrack down an avenue you've already pursued. Um, do you have any helpful images? Maybe you're trying to decode a census page and you can't decrypt some of the text. Maybe you want to upload that and get some help from the community in trying to figure out what that text actually says. You can go ahead and upload a photo of that or add a link to where you found other information already. And one important um, aspect to note is please do not include what we call PII, and that stands for Personally Identifiable Information in the Government. Uh, and that, really, that means like social security numbers and other direct personal information such as that. Uh, that would be stripped out, but it's just easier not to include it to begin with. Uh, again, add any helpful images you might have. And then there's a, you can see the small photo button, and that's how you would go about adding an, an image to your post. And if you scroll down, uh, you can choose the community or place where you want to post your question. 
uh, the system will default to researchers' help, but uh, for the cases of this audience, I assume you'd probably want to post it in the genealogy community. But again, our moderators will usually help to sort and organize those questions uh, when they come in and redirect them if necessary. And again, as I mentioned, um, all content is moderated according to our community guidelines. Uh, questions are moderated in the order they come in. Uh, depending on our workload and the um, volume of questions we're receiving, moderation can take a couple days. Uh, there is no moderation over weekends or federal holidays, days like that. Um, questions may be edited for clarity or, again, to remove content such as PII. Now, getting response. Now, hopefully you've asked your question and someone might have a response for you right away. <clears throat> so here's an example. We have a researcher question asking about naturalization records. Uh, and here you can see a response below that. And that comes in from a National Archives expert staff member. And all National Archives responses are indicated by that small little blue icon that sort of shows the columns of the main archives building. So that way you kind of know that you're getting an answer from an expert. Uh, the average response time from a NARA expert can take a few days, often three to four working days. Now, responses from other community members may uh, come in more, uh, more quickly. Again, they don't have the same workload, and hopefully they might have uh, a direct answer for you uh, fairly soon. And once you get your answer, you can go ahead and click, was this helpful or not? And that sort of helps us to gauge the quality of our answers. You can click the uh, helpful yes button. And maybe you have some additional information you need to include. So for example, you've asked a question, a NARA expert has responded, and they need more information to sort of pursue your question. So you just click that reply button and post a follow-up response below that. One important um, issue to point out is that when you get a reply to your question, you will probably get an email, uh, depending on your notification preferences. Uh, an issue users often have is they will reply directly to that email. Uh, please don't do that. That will go into a dead-end mailbox. What you need to do is come back to History Hub and post your reply on the site. Um, otherwise, uh, we won't receive your response. And here you can see the follow-up response from the researcher with their additional information. And then the follow-up to the follow-up from the NARA staff member. Now responding to a question. Now maybe you're on the community and you see a question where you know you've already been down that road and you can answer and provide some helpful information to the other researcher, which is great. We really encourage that. Uh, we really need your help and you know, the more information we can provide from the community, the better. It makes for a richer, uh, more useful site for everybody. So you see a question that you think you can help with and you'll see the reply button down in the lower right hand corner of that question. So you just go ahead and click that. And you'll see the response field, and it's, it's not unlike the post a question field, a lot of the same uh, functionality. Uh, you can embed links, you can embed helpful images, um, and anything that you think will help answer the question to the other researcher. Uh, now navigating History Hub. We've seen a bit of the site already, uh, so we'll show you just a few more aspects to kind of help acclimate you. Uh, again, this is the home page just below the search bar, and you'll see a list of recent blog posts, you'll see a list of the most recent questions, and on the right-hand side, you'll see a list of all the various communities, again, uh, which Becky covered, such as researchers' help and military records and genealogy, which again is probably the community of most interest to this audience. Um, so you go ahead and click that, and we dive into the genealogy community, and this is what that homepage looks like. You'll see a list, again, of the most recent questions on the left. You'll see a shortcut to the Ask a Genealogy uh, question field. And then you'll also see a list of featured content, which is often uh, recent blog posts. And we'll put up blog posts to kind of provide uh, more detailed information on certain popular research topics to provide users a little more information. So we try to list those in the right-hand side there. Now maybe you want to filter the content a little more and see what else is going on in the genealogy community. You can click the Content button. And this will show all the content. And you can filter that. Uh, you'll see various filters there. You can also see a list um, listing the views and the number of replies that uh, each piece of content has received. So you can kind of gauge the popularity, see where a really, really active conversation is happening that you want to help out with. Uh, now getting help and technical support. Uh, issues do pop up and we're, we're always available to help. And we do have a community set up to sort of provide some basic uh, technical responses and, and help deal with various issues that you might encounter. So if you go to the technical help and support community, again, you'll see a list of recent help topics that have popped up. You'll see a 
question bar, and you'll also see a list of featured content, and that really covers a lot of the common issues that users might encounter, and hopefully that will help uh, answer your, your issue right away. That's not always the case, uh, so if you need additional help, for example, maybe you're unable to create your account, so you can't even get to the point where you can post a question. Uh, you have an account and you're having trouble logging in. You're having difficulty creating a post. Uh, or also, um, maybe you represent an organization and uh, you're interested in sort of partnering with History Hub, maybe getting your, your organization engaged on community on, um, on History Hub, and we'd love to hear about that. Please contact us. But if you have any of those issues, uh, please go ahead and email us at historyhub at nara.gov. Uh, and that's purely just for these types of questions. Please do not email us research questions. We won't be able to respond. Uh, so please join us. Participation is open to anyone. Please sign up for an account, ask your question. Please help us to answer someone else's question. We would love to have your help. We would really encourage that. So please go ahead and join us. So you can visit us at history.gov. And I'd like to see if there's any questions. Thank you so much. To all three of you, thank you very much for your presentation. We do have some questions that have come in from our online audience uh, starting at the very beginning, as soon as you started talking. So we have a question one. What platform is used by hub librarians in data collection? Example, Excel or specialized software? So is there a particular platform that you're using for data collection? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, so if the person wants to um, clarify, um, the, there's not data collection, but the underlying software um, is Jive, it's the same, um, or Aria, they were bought recently, and it's the same software that's used by um, Apple Support Community and I think a couple of the other bigger tech companies. So all of the data resides on History Hub. That's, that's helpful, thank you. We do have another question that's related. Uh, it says, can a History Hub widget be integrated into a website or app? Oh, that's a cool question. Um, you, it does um, generate RSS feeds, so if you're able to embed um, from an RSS feed, um, it doesn't have a native app. Um, do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, if you, if you browse archives.gov, you'll see a few instances of the RSS widget where we've got embedded questions uh, relevant to those certain pages. So on the genealogy page, you'll see a list of, of current History Hub genealogy questions, and that's really just coming from an RSS feed, so that's able to be embedded um, almost anywhere. Uh, there's not sort of a more dynamic widget which allows you to ask questions from a, a separate site. Okay, thank you. Uh, because all three of you are up there, our audience is asking you to speak a little bit louder, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, go on to the next question. Um, this is generally, you know, there's all kinds of questions that you get, and this person asks, are there old maps, quote unquote, old maps available for states like New Mexico that show the boundary changes for that state? For, so, is that the type of question that you can have answered on History Hub? Uh, we can actually, yes and no, we'll guide you to cartographic, uh, the cartographic branch that's out at the National Archives. If the record was of the change of um, boundary or whatever was done through federal records, then they should have the map. Uh, but other than that, we might look on Google and see if there, there is a map available there and give you a choice of how to, how to find it. So that's an example of a, a research question that you might ask, and that's an example, example of a research question you might receive. We don't have the data on History Hub. We're answering questions about the National Archives records and holdings and where, um, where you might find your information. Unless it's already scanned and put on a catalog. And we'll look for there, too, and if we find a map or, or whatever that uh, will answer your question, we'll put the URL into the response so that you can find it. 
Thank you for that thorough answer. I'd also like to put in a plug at this time for our session uh, number six. It's at 3 p.m. Eastern as part of the genealogy fair. Where we're going to have James Moon speaking about land records, in particular about Homestead Act. But if you're still with us at that time, you might want to check in with us again and ask that same question. Uh, going back to the questions specific for the History Hub, um, we have a question here, how, a question about questions. How many questions have been asked? Are public reports available on History Hub metrics? Do we have those available publicly? I'm not sure if we have them available publicly. Um, and how many questions, whoops, I just started <laughs> tipping that forward. Um, we've had, uh, let's see, how many so far? Uh, yeah. A thousand. yeah, a couple thousand questions so far. Um, well, actually, sure. over the past, we yeah, started this in January of, of 2016. And uh, during our first year, we got roughly 200 questions. Um, the following year, we got about 400 questions, and in 2018, we got about 800 questions. This past year, we, up to this point, we have gotten 1,600. So it seems to be doubling, and uh, so we're very happy at that. And those answers are, and the questions are still in History Hub, so if you ask the question, even if it was ans you know, answered two or three years ago, it will come up and you can see the response. Okay. So a couple thousand. A couple of thousand? A handful of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's growing I exponentially. I it's over 2,000. <laughs> yeah, it's over 2,000. Okay, thank you. Uh, going on to the next question that we have from our online audience. They say, I'm seeing a in the genealogy overview, and in quotes, seeking records on name, are those names compiled into a list? So again, in the genealogy overview, are those names compiled into a list? They're not compiled into a list, but they are indexed by, um, by the search and by Google. So if you're thinking that there's a list of, here's a number of people who have been searched, um, that doesn't exist, no. Okay, I'm going to give our online audience a moment to see if any more questions come up. Oh, here we go. We have something. Uh, I get frequent questions from second or third generation farm workers whose relatives came into the U.S. under the radar during World War I and II. Can you suggest resources? So again, resources for second and third generation farm workers whose relatives came into the U.S. under the radar during World War I and World War II. Hmm, that's an interesting question, and usually the person that I will send that question to to get her ideas are Elizabeth Burns, and she has a session later on uh, today. And uh, so if, if you'd like to re re say that question to Elizabeth, she'll be able to give you some better ideas than I can off the cuff. But that's also a good example of a question to ask on History Hub where it can be routed to a, an archivist who can help. Okay. Uh, one of the first questions you got, uh, and I think it's worth reiterating, they asked, is the History Hub curated content or is it more like Wiki where any participant can update the content? Uh, it's not like Wiki. It doesn't operate like um, you wouldn't be able to go back and edit someone else's response. It's more like um, like a support community. So not a Wiki, but a support community where you would have someone ask a question and then their question exists as a discrete um, kind of thing. And then we, you can have answers from, from NARA staff or from the public or from citizen experts. So the, um, the information that is, is kind of grown from the question, not as a discrete article. Okay. And you can go back and, and edit your own re request. And you can also edit your own reply but only the writer can do that. Okay. Oh, that's helpful to know. Um, and then uh, responding to uh, another question, uh, someone was asking about finding family in the Civil War. Again, I would say, you know, that's a good kind of, if you can make a specific question for the online audience there, then 
um, ask your question on History Hub. So going back to the actual questions here, um, are the questions in History Hub organized by National Archives locations and documents held by the locations or by research topics? Currently, it's arranged by topic. Uh, and so we pick broad topics that people can do rather than worrying about what the archive structure is. Yeah, the archive structure is meaningless to most of the general public. Um, we probably care, but um, like we at, at the National Archives care more than the public. So if you ask a military question, you won't know what part of NARA it comes from until the response is done and we'll say, you need to go to these records or to these records and this unit has them. That is helpful because if you're not with the National Archives, you'll hear us uh, referring to record groups. And uh, so that can be confusing. So it is helpful to have it under topics. So going back to our questions, um, the question is, what is the Library of Congress crowd community on History Hub? It is so cool. If you get a chance to check it out, please do. Um, they have this uh, transcription tool that is um, for transcribing their records. And um, basically, it's a community of Library of Congress transcribers who they're just, you can um, sign up for an account um, on the Library of Congress's site yourself and transcribe their documents. And it's great because, and, and also for, please do for the National Archives as well. Um, but uh, it helps because um, a lot of these, um, when you digitize records, um, transcription is not always part of that. Uh, it usually isn't part of that. So uh, we rely on people to um, kind of, uh, the, the benefit of transcribing is that it becomes something that's searchable, it's um, more portable information. Um, yeah, so the Library of Congress, they have a really great community of uh, people who are actively engaged in um, transcribing and then talking to each other about um, the problems that they're having or if they um, have questions. Um, it's a pretty cool community. And if you look at 18th and 19th century records, the handwriting can be unusual. Um, unusual. And, and, <laughs> and the spelling can be unusual. Uh, especially prior to 1850s. So the transcriptions help people understand the contents of the records a lot better. Okay, so I want you to listen closely to this uh, next question that I have, because it's about paper and record keeping. How can we research black Americans suffering from paper genocide, records not in the, on paper, um, who cannot trace their past from the early 1800s? That is a great question to ask on History Hub as well, because that, um, that's the kind of question that is um, so interesting and kind of broad, and it's not really, um, you really want to be able to uh, devote some time to it. But. And also, um, on NARS website itself, we have a black history. Uh, section of our website. If you kind of click down and 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 go uh, to where it says African Americans, and it is a wonderful source that archivists from the National Archives have put together. And really, you know, they have explained, you know, how you can find things, you know, at, um, especially you know about slavery and about your family if you're trying to to figure it out and also there have been places that have done oral histories and and all sorts of rich material um, that is available that may not just be in the written form okay that's terrific I'm glad that we had that question come in um, I think you'll love this next question for the History Hub. Is there a need for transcribers? Why, yes, there is. Not, um, not on History Hub, but there is always a need for transcribers. Um, the National Archives and the Library of Congress both have um, communities set up around um, people who are interested in transcribing. Um, go to Citizen Archivist, and you can find links there. That would be amazing. And you can go through the History Hub community to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Thank you so much. We love transcribers. Um, <laughs> so a very specific question. Uh, I think you'll, again, refer people to go to the History Hub community. They ask, on census from 1840s, how can you tell if the information is correct or not? Oh, well, you have to remember the people who wrote this are taking down um, information that has been given to them orally. Uh, they have went to different census, you know, house to house, and the census taker actually wrote things down. Now, they were supposed to transcribe and use the same kind of handwriting. They had to take classes to, to, to do that so that it all looks the same. But they wrote down what people said. So if someone called their, their parent Peggy instead of Margaret, it may show up as Peggy in the 19, 1840 census, and in the 1850 census, it might be Margaret. So there are some adaptations that you have to make. Sometimes people didn't ask how to spell a name, or if they did, they didn't understand the spelling, and so they kind of can get creative. Um, but, you know, that, that is the fun of working in the census records. So following up on that, um, I, we get this kind of question all the time about the census. So the question is, we know a spelling error has been made on the census. How can we notify the National Archives to make the correction, or is the misspelling just part of the legal record? It's part of the legal record, but you know they are transcribing the census. And so if you notice in the transcription of the census that something is spelled wrong, that can be changed. That's a great answer. Yes, you can always put that in the transcription. So our next question is very specific. Um, they ask, I know most World War I records were lost, but where can World War I military information be found? And it continues. So World War I military information. Specifically, is there information on Camp Jackson, South Carolina? and soldiers who had the Spanish flu in 1918. That is very <laughs> That's specific. a good question, and yes, there, there are records about the Spanish flu and, and specifically in, in that area. Um, if they're talking about soldiers, they're talking about the Army, and yes, the Army records uh, were burned, but the Marine Corps and the Navy were not touched. Um, they, out in St. Louis, they have gathered records immediately from uh, the military and records that were normally not considered permanent were saved, such as payroll records and what have you, and so they can find um, a, as much as they can about an individual. So yes, that is a perfect question to answer on History Hub, and we'll be glad to tell you, you know, where where you might be able to find some resources. Okay. You are such a generalist, Miss Becky Collier. Thank you. Uh, we are so it lucky. It comes from working on History Hub for four years. <laughs> yeah, we're lucky to have you there to, to answer so many different questions that are not actually specific about the History Hub, so thank you. Um, this is a researcher question about coming in person. Mm -hmm. If I come to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., will I be able to obtain records at any time, or do I have to make an appointment? And if able to acquire records, what form of payment do I need for any records? Oh, So an appointment, and is there a cost? It's always best to contact uh, the unit that you're going to visit prior to coming. Don't come cold, ask your question, make sure that they have the records here on site if you're going to come and you want to look at the actual records. There's also, depends on whether records have been microfilmed and what have you, you may not be able to touch the actual records. So please contact the unit first and they will tell you how, you know, to come and what times records can be pulled. Um, right now, I believe we're on a one pull uh, it, and um, it, it is not on a schedule. So it's best to talk to uh, the Ar Archives and One staff first before you come. But you should do that to no matter what part of the National Archives you go to. Please contact them first, whether you do it through Inquire, whether you do it through History Hub, or whether you write them a letter or call. 
Um, it's very important to do that so you're not wasting your time when you come to visit us. We know how important it is and we know that it can be expensive to come to the various sites. So, you know, that's why we ask you to contact us first. And we do have a number of blog posts on History Hub about how to prepare for your in-person visit. And also, uh, my coworker Amber just posted in the chat uh, a website that has all of our location information, so you know uh, where to get that information on uh, who to contact. Um, let's see, if, I think one more question came in. I'm, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and read it. Uh, on land owned, how do you go about how far back it was owned by the family, but if the family is related, I'm not quite, I'm sorry, I'm not Actually, quite sure I understand. We have a whole land yeah. records group on um, History Hub right. that you could post your question there. Okay. But if it's land, for instance, if the place where you live right now, your county will have documentation about uh, the deed for that, that land, and then you can go backwards beginning at the county records and then if that original person had gotten it uh, from like a, um, a federal bounty land grant or what have you, then um, it will take you there. So there's a way to do it, but it's not necessarily at the National Archives. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question has come in about uh, original documents being sent in for the census, specifically Yakima Valley Libraries Archives has original documents of the census taker for the Yakima Reservation from the early 1900s. I've never found these online. Should these be sent to the National Archives? That's a great, great question. Sign up for a account on History Hub and ask it and we'll route it to the, we'll, we'll find an answer. Okay. Uh, at this point, I don't have any more questions, but if you think of something later, uh, we, or we just didn't get to your question because they were coming fast and furious, uh, please submit it to our email account, historyhub at nara.gov. And for that, thank you. If our presenters, uh, like I just said, if we didn't get to your question, send it to historyhub at nara.gov. Videos and handouts will remain available after the event from this YouTube page and from the fairs webpage.